Okay, so I think a portfolio is kind of like a selfie. It's like you take it and then you think it looks good, but then the more you look at it, the more you end up actually kind of hating it. So I've been trying to avoid this for a while now. Tomorrow's me can handle tomorrow's problem, but it's kind of hard to do that when, you know, I need this for work and I also have a YouTube channel where I've talked extensively about how to create your UX portfolio on your case studies. So basically it made me feel like a fraud, but let's change that today. This is what it looks like and it's okay. And like my case studies are pretty decent, but I feel like I'm at a time where I'm moving into the next stage of my career and these case studies and this portfolio website just isn't doing it for me. Also, my real name has an E at the end of it. When I first started my YouTube channel, there was part of me that wanted to keep YouTube separate from like my actual professional persona, but then somewhere along the line this year, it kind of all just like mixed in together. So I really don't care at this point. So here's my plan. Make something that fits my career and YouTube. Make something that I actually like looking at. And I want to write some new case studies because I made a few of these in my first year or so of work and I've been on better and like bigger projects that I'd rather showcase. I run this branding workshop with a lot of my clients and the way I like to introduce it to them is by asking, who are you today? Who do you want to be in five years? And who are you trying to inspire? At the center of it, it's always you, it's yourself, it's your brand. And you know, once I started taking my own advice, I realized I was treating my career, my YouTube, my Dribbble account, all of those different like social media platforms as separate platforms when really they should all be just one cohesive brand. And that's really how I recommend you guys to look at it too. Strive for one cohesive brand and that'll really help you get future clients, future employers, future customers. So to start off, the first thing that I did was create a new Figma file and inside it, I made frames for everything that I want in my brand. So this is really going to depend on how many different platforms you're on or how far you want to expand into those platforms. But I keep my website, I keep my YouTube banners, my end cards, my Instagram highlights, anything that would have to require me to like set up for my brand, I keep it all inside one Figma file on one page. And keeping everything here keeps me from having to switch between applications to look at all these different things. And I can also take a step back so I can be like, you know what, this one thing doesn't really fit with my brand. And I can just make sure that it all looks cohesive because it's all on one page. Then I chose colors that I really liked. So I was talking to one of the UX designers that I work with and he said that colors are like voices and just like music, there are some colors that we find ourselves working better with and you know, some colors that probably we don't vibe with very well. So really ask yourself, what colors do you find easiest to work with? What colors do you end up gravitating to because you just like them? You're going to be looking at your own brand a lot so you might as well choose colors that you really like. And personally, I don't feel like you need a complicated backstory to justify why you chose every color in your brand. You can definitely just like something because it looks nice to you. So I chose a light pink, a dark pink, a off-white color, a yellow, and also a blue to round it out. It's very light, bright, and magical girl. And with these colors, I chose a new layout for my portfolio. Now, I can spend like a week like a month, honestly, trying to figure out a new layout. But I found that was really helpful for me when I give myself like a time box so I don't sink in all that time into a layout. And what I did was choose one true crime video and whatever I had at the very end of that video, that was what I was going to move on with. So I'm able to do this because this isn't my first UX portfolio rodeo. But if this is your first time, it is probably going to end up taking you a little bit longer. I would recommend that you spend about like, I don't know, an afternoon, maybe like a whole day if you really have to and come out with a layout. But keep in mind that you're probably going to be redesigning your portfolio. You're definitely going to be redesigning your portfolio as you get further along into your career because you're going to evolve as a designer. So instead of wasting your time trying to make it perfect, find something that you're attracted to like 55%. Find something that you're 85% happy with and then move on to more important things like writing your case studies, doing interviews, and also just leveling up your skills. So I've briefly mentioned this tool before, but I really like it when doing any kind of mind mapping exercise or creating site maps. And this is an application called Xmind. It's a really great tool. And even though my company has a license for it, I always end up forgetting to ask for one of those licenses because I'm just okay with the free version. Like it's a really great tool. Using Xmind, I like to map out what would actually be on this homepage. So usually it includes things like my name, role, the location I'm at, main navigation, social media, case studies, and resumes. I really want to encourage you guys to remember to put your resume onto your portfolio. Like sure, maybe a recruiter got to your portfolio because of your resume, but as you start creating more things and then branching out and putting content onto different platforms like Dribbble or Behance, sometimes someone is going to find your work 
and they're going to really like it, go to your portfolio and then go into your resume and they can see if you would be fit for a job or not. It happens. It's happened to me and I've gotten a job like that before too. So make sure you keep yourself open for that kind of opportunity. When it comes to my resume, I create it in Figma and then I export it as a PDF. Then I upload it to my Google Drive. So it's really great this way because as long as the name is the same for both of the files, I can just replace my old resume with my new resume and I don't have to change the link at all and it just makes things a lot easier for me. So when it comes to case studies, I like to put my case studies on the home page. And the main reason I like to do this that I feel like I just don't really mention a lot is because I don't want to design and implement another work page. It feels really unnecessary, like an unnecessary interaction because I know people are going to be looking for my case studies when they go onto my portfolio to begin with. So why would I make them click into another page? And I feel like I say this in every single one of my portfolio videos. And I think the reason is because I've been saying it in a way that I'm not really satisfied with because the way that I want to say it is uh, honestly kind of harsh, pretty harsh. Yeah, it's definitely pretty harsh, but I'm going to tell you guys anyway, so I can get it out of my system. If you can't show that you can do the work, no one is going to really bother looking at who you are and what your interests are. That sounds so mean. Now, can you get a job with a really beautiful website and you have your work on a separate page that's not the main page? Yeah, absolutely you can, but it's probably because your work is that good and not because that your website is super styled. It's totally a personal preference how styled your portfolio website is. For me, I've noticed that the more I try to put on it, the more I get overwhelmed and the less I actually output. So back to Xmind, the only other pages that I have on my portfolio are going to be an about page, which is like a short kind of elevator pitch about who I am and my skills, and also a contact page with a contact form. That's all I really got there. The other pages are going to be my actual case study and like project pages where I go into detail about all of the work that I've done. So I'm keeping it super neutral in the background with the off white in my branding guideline, then using my other brand colors as like accent colors. Again, for the font, I want to keep it super simple as well. So I chose the font Montserrat and instead of choosing a font that would pair well with it, I'm just going to change up the size, the color, and also the weight of the font to give that contrast between headings, subheadings, and the body text. So for my name, I gave it a large font size with a dark gray. And then the subtitle is a lighter gray with a smaller font size. Originally, I thought to put all the links in a column on the right hand side, but I thought, you know, maybe if a user is going to be on their mobile device, the text on the left hand side is going to overlap with the links on the right hand side. And personally, I really don't like using hamburger menus. So I decided to move all of my links to the bottom on the left and then go horizontally across. I put a footer in the bottom left hand corner and then I added my social media icons and I chose to make this into a pink. The space at the bottom left on my homepage is going to be where I put my case studies. So now that I have my layout and my colors, it's time to actually make the thing. Nothing too exciting happens here. I'm just coding my website through some basic HTML and CSS. When it comes to hosting my site, I use Netlify and I've been using it for two years and I've had absolutely no issues with it. Like this isn't a sponsored video and this isn't an ad or anything. But when I set up my Netlify a couple years ago, I actually don't even remember how to do it. Like it was that easy if that makes sense. I use a starter account and I attach it to my GitHub and it's completely free and has everything I need. All I'm doing is creating a standard static HTML page to display my work. So how this works is that basically I write code and I send it or push it to Git. And then once my code is on Git, Netlify can see it and it reads it like instructions for how to build a house. And then it builds the house on this little piece of internet land that I've bought called my domain. So now if you guys have my link address, then you can visit me there. And you totally can because the link to my website is in the description. Then after a little bit of work in the morning, a cup of coffee and some ones and zeros, here is my portfolio website. And I know it's not the most flashy thing, but you know what? I'm not that flashy either. So I think it works out for my brand. That should be on my business card. Charlie Chung, UX designer, not that flashy of a girl. <laughs> if you're interested, you can also read my case studies too. But in the next few weeks, I do plan on walking over the case studies that I have and the one that I'm making right now, talking about why I made certain decisions, how the project actually went, a little bit of like tips and warnings that I can kind of offer you guys. But it feels really good to actually have this blocker out of the way. Like I feel like I'm able to move on to my other projects and like the other things I actually want to do and not have to worry about my portfolio being garbage now. So that's a really good feeling. Anyways, thanks for watching as always. Be sure to like this video if you liked it, comment, subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!